Yo, what is going on, guys? Welcome back to another video. So after yesterday's just utter madness with the PLD and Jacob Markstrom trades on top of the Barkley Goudreau waiver claim, it is clear that even though the Stanley Cup final is still going on and that series is also turning into a classic, we are fully underway with the offseason. It is utter madness. These GMs are getting on the phones trying to make things happen. So I thought it'd be a good idea to get on here and update my trade board of the players that I think not only are the most likely to get traded, but also based on how good they are. I'm not going to have Arthur Colley of top three just because he had uh, he requested a trade. So we're going to go through that right now. Again, based on how likely they are, how good of overall players there are because there is legit eight high-level players, either very good top six forwards or top four defensemen or just straight-up all-stars that I think are going to be available for trade this summer. Are they 1,000% going to get trade? No, of course not. I'm going to break that down. But there is going to be some serious options. And when looking at it compared to prior off-seasons, teams have more salary cap looking at the $4 million increase up to $88 million. So there's going to be a lot of mobility this offseason, hopefully. So without further ado, let's dive into it. And we're going to start with first and then work our way down to 10th. I don't want to like leave you guys hanging and especially once we get down to like if I started at 10 and worked our way down you probably know who's coming up so we're going to start with first and up first I have Linus Olmark I have Linus Olmark at first on the trade board when looking at it especially after the Jacob Markstrom trade went down it is clear that the, the market is heating up for Linus Olmark he is the clear-cut guy that is most likely to get traded considering the fact that the Boston Bruins have to pay Jeremy Swayman I can't really imagine them running it back with Jeremy Swayman making between seven to eight point five million dollars and Lena Solmark getting paid $5 million to be a backup. It worked last year when they were more so splitting it. And on top of the fact that Swayman was only making like 3.5, you can't run it back this season. You need to trade Linus Olmark. And obviously, Linus Olmark is a very good goalie in his own right. Had a bit of a down year after having a 938 and winning the Vesda. But when looking at his last five seasons, he's posted a 915, 915, 917, 938, and a 915. So over the last five years, and some of those are in Buffalo years where he didn't really play that much, but still, he's playing on Buffalo. He didn't play a ton of games, but it was a good. Buffalo Sabres, who sucked. He has not been below a 915 since six years ago. It is very impressive what Linus Olmark can bring to the table, on top of the fact that you could easily slide him into your salary cap situation next year at only $5 million. Yes, he's going to need extension. That's maybe where things get tricky. You trade him to only a place where there's going to be an extension in place, but I think someone is going to pay a premium for Linus Olmark, who at worst is a top 11 to 15 goalie in the entire NHL. At best, can be between that 6 to 10 range. So, next up, next up, we have Nikolai Ehlers at second place on this. When looking at it, it's looking more and more likely that he's going to get traded. Of course, the re report came out that he's probably not going to sign an extension with the Winnipeg Jets. And when looking at the Winnipeg Jets, this isn't a guy that you can bring into the season as a pending UFA. It's not like you're going to trade him at the deadline considering the Winnipeg Jets are yet again going to be a playoff team. So I think you need to trade him this offseason, trade him preferably for like a legit top four defenseman and just get dude, another guy on this list that we're going to get to would be a pretty good one for one or something like that around that. But when looking at Ehlers. I think the Winnipeg Jets, yeah, I think they got to trade him. And when looking at how he's been utilized in Winnipeg, this guy is very underrated right now. This year, he only had 61 points, but he played less time than Mason Appleton. When looking at his three prior seasons, when he was getting a bit more ice time, he has 139 points in 154 games. Good for 74-point pace. Just such a fantastic skater. Extremely smooth in transition. One of the best zone entry guys in the entire NHL. That's why I want him on my New York Islanders. Him and Matt Barzell would be absolutely electric. So I I think if he goes somewhere else, it's actually going to prioritize him as the true first liner that he is. He can easily give you 75, 80 points, and as a result, only making $6 million next year, easy to fit under a team's cap situation, and I think he's only going to want like an 8 by 75 or 8 by 8 He's not going to walk in, get traded, and say, I want $9 million, considering he had a bit of a down year. So when looking at him, I think he gets moved, and I think he's a very good player. Patrick Line at third. Now when looking at this, he has he's working, his agent is working with the Columbus Blue Jackets to get some type of a deal done. It's going to be somewhat tough to do, considering there's two years left at 8.7 million dollars but I think a team will be willing to take that on either for like just trade them for the two years 8.7 million and give up like a second round pick it's not gonna be that much or if they retain so much somebody will be able be willing to give up a serious package considering Columbus I don't really think is expecting to make the playoffs next year I think they're probably gonna want a package of young guys and picks I think it's gonna be a deal that can end up getting done and when looking at line a although this
this year definitely had his struggles, both injury-wise as well as mental health, and I really hope that both of those improve next season. When he is healthy, well, he wasn't even healthy the prior two seasons in Columbus, but when this guy is playing, he is very good. With his first two full seasons in Columbus, he had 48 goals, 60 assists, 108 points, and 111 games. Granted, again, he played 56 and 57 games in those two seasons, or 50, no, 56 and 55, but when he played, when he was healthy for Columbus over those two years, he put up around 35 goal and 45 uh, assist, 80 point pace. So when this guy, if he can get back on track, which we're all hoping for, he's a very likable guy to root for, you could have on your hands a legit 35 and 35, maybe even sniffing 40 and 40 with the right center. So I think someone is eventually going to trade for Patrick Line. I think it is very likely, and, and he's a very good player. So yeah, he checks in at third. Fourth, Jacob Chikrin. When looking at Chikrin, there's obviously two paths. Either Ottawa can make some kind of extension work, but that's going to be tough considering they have Shabbat and Sanderson locked up long term, making north of eight million or eight million dollars and like eight point zero five million dollars. So I think it's most likely that they end up trading Jacob Chikrin. I think that it's more possible than a Nikolai Ehlers that they go into the season with him and trade him at the deadline, considering Ottawa isn't really that much of a contender versus Winnipeg. You want, you want something, you're not going to take picks, just picks and prospects at the deadline. Maybe Ottawa goes into this season and just sees how it goes, but I think they most likely do trade Jacob Chikrin, and when looking at him over the last four seasons, 136 points in 233 games, good for around 48 point pace, very solid defensively, six foot two, 220 pounds, teams prioritize that size and skill that he offers to the table, and I think they're going to get a package if they trade him similarly to like a Noah Hannafin who got a first, a conditional second, as well as a young player. So I think the Ottawa Senators most likely trade Jacob Chikrin, and for a decent amount of teams, he'd be a top pair guy. A couple contenders, he'd be more so more so of a second pair guy, but considering he's only making $4.6 million next season, most contenders can fit him out of that cap sheet. It might be a little bit tough to carve out an extension long term, but next season he is very affordable for a given team. At fifth, Mitch Marner. Mitch Marner probably would have been first or second immediately after the Toronto Maple Leafs elimination. But now you have the reports coming out from Darren Dreger that Brad Living might be willing to extend him, then trade him. Now, obviously, Darren Dreger did report some stuff in 2019 that kind of helped Mitch Marner get some more money, put some reports out there. So I don't know how much to believe, but I think it definitely is becoming more and more likely that the Toronto Maple Leafs potentially bring back a Mitch Marner. Because when looking at it, unlike some of the other guys like an Ehlers that only makes $6 million, like a chicken that makes 4.6, Mitch Marner makes $10.9 million. That's not easy to fit under the cap space. And I see some people saying like, oh, if Toronto brings him back on an eight-year, nine million, eight-year, ten million dollar deal, you do that. Mitch Marner's gonna want a fucking raise. Mitch Marner's gonna want 11, 11.5, maybe even 12 million dollars. Like Mitch Marner is not the guy that is going to take a serious pay cut when looking at it long term. So I think teams might feel a little bit scared of that. That we got to give up this big haul for a guy that has a high cap cap hit next year, and we got to lock him up for eight years at 11.5, 12 million dollars. I still think it's perfectly reasonable that a team does do that, and that's why he's fifth on this because when looking at him, he is so good in the regular season and some teams just want to make the playoffs a little they don't really care about his playoff woes when looking at a team maybe like the Seattle Kraken or something like that that could take a swing they just want to make the goddamn playoffs so when looking at Mitch Marner I I'm lower on the fact of Toronto ending up trading him in the overall market of Mitch Marner but he is still just such an uber talented player so I gotta have him here at fifth sixth Martin Natchez another guy that a month ago probably would have been much higher on this list it was looking like that they were going to prioritize uh keeping Jake Gensel, and as a result, Martin Natchez, who was looking at a $6.57 a $6. million extension, probably was on the chopping block. Now maybe Gensel is available. I think we can all agree that Brett Pesci is already leaving. So I don't really know what's really happening with the situation. I still think it is very likely that they end up trading him considering, and also with this, I'm not including Jake Gensel, unrestricted free agency trading rights is completely different than trading restricted free agent. I'm not doing any unrestricted free agents because that's just like giving, that's just like getting a middle round pick just to sign a guy. It's basically free agency. So when looking at Martin Natchez, but yeah, I, I think that it is likely that they could potentially trade him considering he's a restricted free agent, considering they could get a decent amount of first plus a young player, a decent roster player, plus a second round pick, get a cheaper guy instead of Natchez at $6.57 million. And this guy had 71 points last year. This year took a bit of a step back, only down at 53, but I think in the right situation, he can be back to, he can go back to being a 60 to 70 point guy, a very solid top six winger and the Carolina Hurricanes have definitely have a tough decision on their hands at seventh 
Arthur Kaliev checks in here. He obviously wanted a trade out, and I think a trade out is very likely, is very possible. Considering this year, he did get a little bit of a diminishing role, only had 15 points in 51 games, but this is a guy that had 28 points in 56 games last year. He's still young. He's either 22 or 23 years old. He was a 2019 draftee, and I think in the right situation, I don't think that he's ever going to become a stud, but could he become a 40 to 50 point solid middle sixer, maybe even sniff 55? It is perfectly reasonable. This guy's a good build, six foot, six foot two. 210 pounds, solid underlying numbers. It's going to be very interesting to see what team buys low on an Arthur Collier because I think it's only going to cost like a second round pick. And if I was a team that has the salary caps, probably well, it's not even making that much money. But I would, I would take a, I would take a flyer on an Arthur Kaliev, considering this guy's played over 200 games, has been a, a half a point per game player in the NHL in a given season. So it'd be very interesting to see where Arthur Kaliev ends up. Next up, we're starting to get into elite players that I don't really think are that likely to be traded, but I think UC Soros definitely has a possibility to be traded, especially after seeing what the Calgary Flames got for Jacob Markstrom, which I thought was a good package considering his cap it. Yes, they retained some, but the age, the fact that he was 34. When looking at UC Soros, 28 years old, he is coming off a bit of a down year at only a 906 save percentage, but this is a guy that had a 9, at least a 918 the prior three or four seasons. He has been one of the best goalies in the entire NHL. So I think if the right offer came across to Barry Trotz for UC Soros, which would be like two first-round picks or like a first-round pick and a very good young player at this point, I think that they definitely could consider that. If I had to lean one way, I think they probably do end up extending him. But it's also very confusing because they have Askarov in the minors right now, a guy that they used, what, like the 11th overall pick on back in 2020. So it's a very interesting situation to monitor. I could see them end up trading him and just getting an absolute haul and more so going down this retool rebuild route. But also they made the goddamn playoffs this season. Season, so it wouldn't surprise me if they're more so aggressive. They have two two roads are converging right now for the National Predators. It's going to be very interesting to see which direction they go in. Another guy at number nine that I think is a fantastic player, but I don't really think a trade is going to materialize at this point is Pavel Buchnevich. Again, it's up in the air. He has one year left at $5.8 million, which makes it very possible that a team gives up a shit ton for a Pavel Buchnevich, considering the fact that, yes, he did have a bit of a down year this year at 63 points in 80 games, but the prior two seasons, 67 and 63, 76 and 73, six foot three, big guy, plays both sides of the ice. He is a fantastic player, but I think at this point, it's looking more and more like they might sign him to that extension. They might keep the Kairou Thomas uh, Buchnevich core together and kind of do a retool. They got to fix that defense, but the rest of the team, there is some promise for them to be competitive again in two to three years. So I think it's possible. I'd say it's like 60 percent no for no 65 percent no 35 percent yes but again considering I'm factoring just how good they are in the likelihood Pavlovich Devich is a fantastic player one of the most underrated players in the entire NHL so as a result I have him on this list and then at number 10 there was no other real star guy that I could really find that I thought had a serious possibility of getting traded so I ended up going with Riley Smith now this would be more of a cap dump honestly considering he has one year left at five million dollars even though Kyle Dubas gave up only a third round pick to get him from Vegas it's kind of been a flop only 40 points this season for a $5 million guy, you expect 45, 50, 55 points. You expect a legit second liner. Riley Smith really wasn't that, wasn't that this year. So I could see Dubas uh, shipping him out in some type of deal where they package him with a, bu- with a bunch of picks and prospects for salary cap situations, money out, money in to go out and get somebody or just end up dumping him to a rebuilding team, attaching a third round pick or a fourth round pick for veteran leadership to one of these re- rebuilding teams. I think Riley Smith is very likely to potentially be on the move this summer. So when looking at the final, Omar Ehlers, Line A, Chikrin, Marner, Natchez, Kaliev, Soros, Buchnevich, and Smith. Let me know in the comments, what do you think about this? Who'd you move up? Who'd you move down? And I'll be seeing the next one.